Hello friends, so we have almost come to the end of the chapter and this chapter and towards the end we will talk about the natural selection, Hardy-Weinberg's principle and then the evolution of man right, right from this Ramapithecus, Australopithecus, we had hominoid and then Homo erectus, Homo sapiens and all this uh, we are going to discuss. So, uh, thanks a lot for listening to towards the uh, session and now we are towards the end and I am excited to finish the chapter. So, first we will talk about natural uh, selection. So, now what is natural selection? Is that the nature has its own way of making survival of fittest. Nature selects the individual on what to live, what not to live, whom to live and whom not to live. So first is one allele makes an organism more or less fit to survive. So they mean to say that one gene, one mutation or one dominancy or one recessiveness is totally enough to make an organism survive or to make them die. So that is natural selection. In natural selection you have three different kinds. One is stabilizing selection, the other is directional selection, the other is dis disruptive selection. So first is stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection is mean that, so I will be uh, explaining you with the help of the graph so that it will be easier for you. So now in stabilizing selection, there is something called as a higher peak or a point at which the organism, the population reaches its height, it takes the upper hand. So that is a particular point where an organism will reach its peak. For example, when you talk about sparrows, so many years back, there were sparrows, they had enough food, nutrition and the geographical area was fantastic and what well, eventually they ended up improving their population so that is called the stabilizing they have stabilized where the population is in a fine amount okay that is stabilizing selection next is directional selection is where the direction moves from one point to the other point for example these sparrows are happily living and suddenly there is a drought or there is uh, some natural calamities which make these sparrows not to survive. Now this, the sparrows whichever manages to escape from the particular natural calamity will alone survive. So it could lead to in any direction of the curve. It could, really, it could make them to move towards any one direction so which means that they could relatively reduce in population and in redu reduction of population they could be lesser males, greater females or greater males and lesser females. So that is about the direction selection. Next we will talk about disruptive selection. Disruptive means what? There is some hindrance, there is just a disruption. So which means that there is an increase in the population again decrease in the population and again it leads to the increase in the population for example Darwin's finches so in the Galapagos island there were so many finches uh, species of finches and eventually when these finches lack food there was reduction in the, uh, the number right and later when these uh, finches modified their beak they started uh, perching upon different um, in early food sources. So that's how the again the population the finches took its upper hand. So that's all about the disruptive selection. Okay. Now next we'll talk about Hardy Weinberg principle. So Hardy and Weinberg were two different individuals. And what did they find was now there are n number of organisms throughout the planet. It could be um, the pathogens of human body, microbes, could be plants, animals, and uh, different types of animals, different species, the different species of plants. So what exactly is happening? There is always an evolution, there is always a variation happening. So one species could, uh, for example, if there is a green beetle, green beetle will have its dominant gene, it will have its um, normal gene and it has its normal gene mean, meaning I am talking about the heterozygous gene and it has its recessive gene and what probably happens and what sort of variation happens and what will happen to the 
second generation of the green beetle will be the exact green or if it undergoes a recessive uh, mutation and will will it be a lighter color tone beetle so this is what discussed in the hardy weinberg law later they came to a conclusion where a formula this a plus b the whole square normal algebraic expressions right so that is what p plus q the whole square is p square plus 2p q plus q square and there was one uh, uh, order where p plus q is always one so when you know the gene frequency the recombination frequency of any one of these alphabets you can find the other suppose you really know p you can learn q right because p plus q is equal to 1 Now p is zero point three plus q, which is equal to one. Then what is q? Q is equal to one minus zero point three. So you can find the value of q that is zero point seven. And now when you substitute in the formula that is zero point three the whole square and all this, now you will convert into percentage. All you divided by hundred. Now you you get hundred percentage. So which means that they are all meaning to say that one only when there is The, even when there is this lot of disruptions like dominant gene, recessive gene, or a mediocre heterozygous gene, eventually the all the genes are going to distribute itself in a hundred percent fullest potential way. So that is Hardy-Weinberg. So you even call it as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. There is always equilibrium. All the recessive gene, the dominant gene, or the heterozygous dominant gene, they always maintain itself in a Dominant in a proper uh, equilibrium manner, right? And then we'll talk about the um, human evolution. So first we had Rama Pitikas and Shiva Pitikas, and these were like resembled like apes. So they never had all these bipedal uh, walking. They walked with four limbs. They had body hairs. So the teeth were all long, and the incisors were even more long, and they had a lot of uh, facial hairs. Right, and these are these Rama Pitikas and Shiva Pitikas, and the Rama and Shiva Pitikas they resemble like Dryo Pitikas, right? So they're all ape, right from the apes. So now they have this Dryo Pitikas had a lot of body hair, right? So now what happens that they found that this Rama Pitikas and the Dryo Pitikas had a connectivity in developing the hairy structure, a lot of hairy like fur in the body, and next. Came the after the Rama Pitikas, the after the Rama Pitikas, Rama Pitikas and Shiva Pitikas, they had this Australo Pitikas where it like the origin was from West Africa, so you call it as the Australian uh, ape man, where this man was so gigantic and he was semi erect, right? So he he couldn't stand. Erect, but he was semi erect, and where uh, he used to walk, and they were like bipedal sort of activity. He walked with the help of two limbs, and the other upper limbs, the man used to uh, perch on to the um, like fruits. And these humans were like omnivores, like whatever they find, they eat. And after the Australopithecus, there was Homo erectus, where these humans they started dwelling in the caves. So there was total uh, bipedal activity. So they were walking with the help of their limbs, and where uh, there is an origin of fire, making of fire, eating meat was all practiced in Homo erectus, and then Homo sapiens, where uh, we we humans all have been uh, evolved, and where I eat from the making of fire, and then burning of the meat, and then eating, hunting of animals. All the humans are then making small huts and dwelling in the caves, and after which now we have evolved into humans with full of technology, full of WhatsApp, Twitter, and everything. And now we humans are highly talented with full of scientific background and everything. And that's how. So just imagine how how many years, how many millions of years it would have taken uh, for the primitive uh, human to become a fantastic. human being so we are towards the end of the chapter hope you all like your chapter i need your valuable ratings and comments below thank you